That's right, that's right. So thank you very much for coming out this evening. Yes, I'm primarily trained as a medieval literature specialist, and so I think it's quite reasonable if some of you are scratching your heads and wondering what in the world is she doing talking about climate change and global refugees. And so I very briefly want to tell you why I'm up here and how this came to be. So my concern with climate change goes back since I was a, an undergraduate and had a really dramatic sort of uh, road to Damascus moment with, with a really charismatic biology teacher a long time ago. And, let, and it wasn't just me, a number of us had this, this experience. Thank you very much, perfect, okay. Um, but uh, uh, last summer, uh, I finally stopped just talking to talk and, and decided to walk the walk, and I joined an organization, I'm just going to briefly mention what this is, called the Climate Reality Project. And the Climate Reality Project is over a decade old, it was created by Vice President uh, Al Gore. And to date, there's something like 15,000 of us across the globe who've been trained as climate reality leaders. Last summer, what that meant for me was I spent three extremely intense days in Seattle learning about climate science. But the primary focus for this project is making more and more people who know enough about climate science and climate politics and everything that goes along with it in order to go into the world and actually start bringing the conversation to people as opposed to just sort of the, the noise that we get on, on talk radio and elsewhere. So if any of you want to know about how to become a climate reality leader, uh, please talk to me after the, uh, after the presentation. I'd be more than happy to tell you about it. It was a really kind of life-changing deal. And, and it's kind of fun to be part of an organization that has trainings all over the globe several times a year. Um, I think the new, latest one's in Mexico City, but they're all over the world. And, uh, and it's fun to be part of a, 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 the in-crowd of 17 or 15,000 people. So enough of that. So I'm going to address four questions this evening. Two of them quite briefly, and two of them in considerably more detail, and <clears throat> uh, I have to warn you, the first two are sort of just factual matters. The last two, however, uh, I have to warn you about the third question. How is this connected to climate change? It's going, the third question is going to be some pretty heavy sledding, and so you're going to see some images that are pretty disturbing, and some facts, and some, some, some events that are not easy to watch or to think about, but I want to assure you going out. That often people want to avoid talking about climate change because it just feels like all the news is very bad, there's nothing we can do about it, and I want to assure you that is not the message you're going to get here this evening. So I'm going to ask you to buckle your seatbelts, if you have any, uh, for, the first, for the third section, because the fourth section, what can be done about it, we do have things to do about it. The news is good news. The, the question really is not whether we will fix it, but how soon we will fix it and how much suffering we can alleviate in the process. So that's my promise to you. And uh, now let's get started. So first of all, the official international legal definition of refugee is one that has problems for the question of climate change refugees because the definition, this was part of the 1951 Re Convention on Refugees, and it was formulated in the years after World War II when there were enormous amounts of people uh, dislocated throughout Europe, largely but not exclusively. And as you can see here, there are some problems that we want to extrapolate to people who are dispossessed or displaced from climate. Persons dislocated from nations of origin out of well-founded fear of being persecuted on the basis of race, religion, nationality, and so on and so forth. So there's two elements of this that are problematic. One is displacement across nations of origin. Climate change does not know national boundaries. And dislocations that accrue from climate events can happen internally to nations and across nations and throughout regions. That's a problem for trying to apply this standard. But the far greater problem is this word persecute. It's easy to imagine malign intent on the part of certain bodies that want to harm others. We don't have to think much further than, for instance, uh, the humanitarian crisis in Rwanda or similar kinds of events where people are targeted by another group. But it's very hard to imagine that the planet is targeting groups of people. It is hard to imagine that carbon dioxide is specifically targeting to persecute groups of people. And yet that is precisely what's going on. But legally it doesn't fit. And that causes problems for, for what we do with those people who end up being dislocated. We're going to come back to that later on. So here's the scale of the crisis. So again, remember that global refugees, the official numbers, do not include climate change refugees because they don't fit that 1951 definition. But the numbers are pretty big. And I think the main thing I want you to look at here, and there's always disagreement as to whose numbers are, are, are to be believed, but the scale and the scope is pretty well agreed upon. And what I want you to notice is that at the beginning of this century, there's a pretty hefty 37 and a half million people, not climate change, but, but people who fit under the earlier definition. But notice that between 2000 and 2013, there is an increase, but it is not a dramatic increase. 
But in the last two to three years, we've seen a huge uptick in, in global refugees. The current numbers, um, I couldn't find, but I have no doubt that they're going to be higher. So when we talk about climate refugees, people who are not included in those earlier numbers, 2008, and again, these numbers are sort of consensus from a bunch of different sources, including the United Nations High Commission on Refugees and a number of other non-governmental bodies. Um, fewer than 20 million, that's still a lot of people dislocated on the basis of climate events. Some are, going to be, some are able to go back home, many never go back home at all. Um, the estimates in 2009 in a particular study pointed out that even though we might have numbers in the 20 millions, we've got hundreds of millions of people who are living in situations that are on the verge of risk. People who are living in coastal zones, for instance. People who are living in places that are prone to wildfires or mudslides. But this last number is a, a really well accepted, pretty much this is a consensus number. A, around 200 million people by the midpoint of the century are going to be homeless as a result of climate events. 200 million. So it's a crisis, it's real, and it's going to affect all of us whether we are among those people or not. So what's the connection with climate change? I'm going to try to keep an eye on time here. So in what ways is climate change a factor? Multiple ways. And in order to address that, one of the first things I have to do is spend a few moments just talking about basic climate science. For those of you who, have, uh, who know a little bit about climatology, I apologize, this is going to be really entry-level stuff. For those of you who are in my climate science or climate studies classes uh, this semester, you've, you've heard it already. So, but, uh, but for everybody else, I want to make sure that we're all sort of on the same page. But I want to start with this beautiful image of, of this world that we share. This photograph is called the Blue Marble. It was taken in 1972 by the Apollo 17 crew. And fun fact, it's the most reproduced photograph in the history of photography, I guess. Um, and one of the things that's really powerful about this, and it was really powerful at the time, it was the first time that we'd ever, anyone on Earth had ever seen the Earth from a distance as this sort of finite, beautiful but finite place, with limits on resources, obviously. So here's a really interesting photograph that makes clear the relationship between the curvature of the Earth and the extremely narrow sort of coating of the atmosphere that makes life on Earth possible. You can sort of forgive people who might say, well, look at the sky, it's infinite. Climate change can't be a thing. How can just burning fossil fuels be a problem? Because the sky does look infinite, until you look at it this way. Sort of an interesting way to look at this. If you were in a car that could travel through the air, you would bust through the stratosphere in about five to 10 minutes, traveling at normal car speeds in a magical car of some sort. <laughs> so it's really, it's finite. And what that means is that, yeah, the, the volumes, well, what are the volumes of climate change uh, creating greenhouse gases that we're emitting? Well, we're going to talk about that in a moment. So how it's supposed to work is that that atmospheric band makes life on Earth possible, not too hot, not too cold. So high energy solar radiation penetrates through the atmosphere, reaches the Earth, gets absorbed, most of it, 93% or so, by the oceans and the rest by the uh, terrestrial uh, parts of the Earth and warms the Earth. Now, if it stayed on the Earth, we'd be in big trouble. We'd be boiling. So a certain amount of it has to be radiated back in much less energetic, longer wavelength uh, infrared or, or heat waves. And it's that balance, that homeostasis between stuff coming in and stuff going out that makes life on Earth as we know it possible. So if all of it went away, we'd be a frozen cold rock. If much of it stayed here, we'd be Venus, we'd be boiled. And it's this balance between the amount that gets bounced back and the amount that gets emitted that makes life uh, you know, livable as we know it. This is the problem. Millions of tons of man-made global warming producing greenhouse gases. What in the world happened to my... <laughs> it wasn't like that earlier. Anyway, um, being pumped into the air on a daily basis. Whoops. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're going backwards. I am going backwards, but I was pressing the forward. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Maybe I'm just going to stand away from it. Okay. That's really strange. What did we miss? No, no, okay. I know what's going on here. Okay, so that, that amount, that, that volumes of greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere are increasing the amount, it's essentially thickening that atmospheric layer so that more and more of that heat radiation that's radiated away from the Earth gets trapped, gets bounced back. And it's getting thicker and thicker with every day. As I'm sure some of you know, we've passed the 400 parts per million mark just within the last 12 months. 
and that's bad. <laughs> Just say that that's bad. That is a higher amount of carbon dioxide than certainly human history has ever known. And carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So why that's important is that not that the Earth has never known such high amounts of carbon dioxide, but the human life on Earth certainly has never known it. And here's the critical point. The rate of increase is unprecedented, as far as we can tell, in the history of the globe. What you'll notice, really, is that it starts around 1850, that the change and that the rate increases, not just the volume of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but the, but the rate increases as well. And so it doesn't take too much to sort of realize that, ah, oh, 1850 was about when we started industrially burning fossil fuels. So it's the beginning of the Industrial Revolution that started this going. And what you'll also notice is, I wish I had a little pointer here, is that there's a bit of an uptick after 1950, after World War II, when economies started going. But the rate is going much, much faster. There is, however, so it's not just the volume of carbon dioxide. It is the speed with which the increasing amount is going into the atmosphere that is, that is desperately frightening here. There is one tiny piece of good news here. If we hadn't spent 10 minutes at the beginning trying to mess around with our AV, I'd see if anybody could figure it out. But I'll just point your attention to this nifty little thing that's happening in the last three years. It's tailed off. Now, we're not home free. You'll see that there's a flattening of the graph. That means that the rate of increase has, has largely flattened out for the last two or three years. That's great news. We're making changes across the globe. Remember, there's good news at the end of the talk. That's what's going on here. But it's not enough because we still have to drop down those, that raw volume of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Red doesn't really show up very well in the slide, but I suppose it's OK. So what does that energy mean? It means that. That's the kind of energy that we're putting into the atmosphere. And it's pretty measurable. 400,000 Hiroshima bombs every day. All right, that's pretty shocking stuff. So, so what's the connection then? What's the connection between what we're doing to the atmosphere and global climate refugees? The relationship. So first of all, I'd like to talk about what I call first order impacts, but you could think of it as proximal causes, very direct causes. A landslide wipes out your house, you no longer have a home. That would be a first order or proximal cause. We're also going to talk about distal or second order causes. It's pretty obvious things. In increasing order, perhaps, of, of magnitude, extreme heat events cause people to move. Flooding causes far more people to move. And extreme weather events, hurricanes, fires, tsunamis, mudslides, that kind of thing. Here's the hard stuff. So extreme heat, first of all. Measurements of global temperature require a whole bunch of averaging out across the globe in various ways, but no matter whose study you're looking at, the specifics may vary, but the overall pattern is very clear. That if we look at a baseline, that, uh, geez, what's happened to a, there's a, we lost our, uh, our, our axis down here. Um, shoot. It's, I think it's roughly 1950 or so, but basically, that we see a huge spike. We see a huge spike in average temperatures. Let's put this in much more immediate terms. 16 of the 17 hottest years ever recorded in human history have been since 2001. Now, interestingly enough, 2017 was, was a little bit flattened, was a little bit less. 2016 is the record holder. So what does this mean in human terms? The last two years' worth of record temperatures around the world, 40th consecutive year with above averages for the last century, and it continues to go up, so it's not like we're static in that regard. So here's some of the numbers. Now these are flat numbers. This is not heat indexed, right? Numbers like 113, probably every one of you in this audience has at some point or another been outside when it's that hot, but we don't live in it. And if we're in the first world, it's a lot easier to adapt to that kind of heat, one, for relatively short periods of time, and two, we have AC. That is not true of all the people in the world, and that makes a big difference. But the other thing, too, is, is, is that um, you can't last out of doors without some kind of amelioration. Even young, healthy people don't do well in this kind of temperature. People who work out of doors in the United States are really suffering, particularly in the Southwest, who have to be in that kind of temperature. Here's Kuwait, just had a record breaker just this last summer. Yeah, 51 centigrade, that's kind of stunning. And again, even, even hail healthy young people like yourselves, you can't really be out of doors for more than an hour or two in that kind of temperature without really risking significant uh, uh, heat stroke. This is not livable. And it's certainly not livable for birds. 
stunning, right? I'll just show you a few more of these amazing things, and then we'll look at the ones when the heat index shows up. 123 in India. So again, flat, not heat indexed. Yeah, 129. Just ponder that for a moment. But it's a dry heat. That doesn't help. But here's what it means when you add in heat index. Right, yeah, holy cow is exactly right. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how much adaptive strategy you have or how much AC you have, infrastructure simply cannot, cannot sustain even within your house with AC running full blast. That's just not sustainable. Parts of the world are becoming unlivable on the basis simply of heat, simply of extreme heat. So what, oh, for the... Um, I can't remember what it exactly said, but basically, uninhabitable. Parts of the world are becoming uninhabitable. <laughs> yeah, those wild-eyed crazies at the Max Planck Institute, surely they are extremists. <laughs> So that's extreme heat. What about extreme weather events? Far more dislocations are occurring as a result, or will continue to uh, be a result of extreme weather. Well, I mentioned a little while ago that all of the heat that comes into the ocean, the, by far the vast volume, the, the, the greatest proportion of heat, 93 to 95 percent of the sun's energy gets absorbed by the oceans. And part of that is a good thing. It means that the oceans have acted as a buffer for the heat that comes to the Earth. But it also means that in the way that systems buffers work, they reach a limit. And what we started to discover over time is that deeper and deeper layers of the oceans, the world's oceans, are getting hotter and hotter. And so there will be a limit to the degree to which the oceans can kind of make up for all of this greenhouse effect. But in the process of doing that, the oceans are becoming more and more energetic. And energetic oceans create much more extreme weather events. Warmer oceans create much more extreme weather events. So I'm not going to worry about that, that particular the graph there. So we've always had hurricanes and tsunamis, but we've never had them like we have them now. They're more powerful, they're more frequent, they're more voluminous, and it's a direct consequence of global warming. Warmer oceans lead to more intense hurricanes, just the amount of energy that's there to create that kind of uh, uh, effect. They, they get stronger faster. When they make landfall, there's more water in them. And so when they do drop water, the flooding is much more intense. And then I think this is about the jet stream and we're not gonna talk about, it. oh, yeah, 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 storm surge. So flooding goes up, not simply because sea level is rising because of the melting of the polar ice caps, and I'm not, I'm not gonna have time to talk about that at all tonight, that's a much larger part of the story. But then the storm surges are much more energetic and simply the, the uh, a body of water that is warmer, it occupies more space. So there is more water there, and the water that is there, the more energetic it is, the higher up it goes. And that has real consequences for people who live in low-lying coastal areas, like most of humanity does, actually. We are largely a coastal species, and so this is significant. Okay, I'm going to stop with the jet stream. Forget the jet stream. So what did that mean last summer? Roughly a third of Bangladesh was underwater for weeks at a time. And that's not just inconvenient. That's, that's the large uh, 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 grain-growing uh, floodplains of Bangladesh. And that means people starving. They're either wiped out of their homes. These are people who are not going back to home anytime soon. But it wasn't just that. Of course, you know, the, the horrible hurricane system that wiped out whole areas of, well, you know, the whole her the, the Harvey to Irma, Jose and Maria, all of that. Again, this kind of total devastation. These are people, this is first order effect dislocation, homes that you cannot go back to. And even when the homes are intact, cities' infrastructure are simply not built. This is not Venice. This is not Aguante in Venice. This is Havana. It doesn't, you know, buildings will start to crumble under these sorts of circumstances. Infrastructure is not going to be able to sustain it. And of course, there's our own Puerto Rico, which now, seven months later, large parts of Puerto Rico are st significant parts, not the majority, but are still without electricity months on, and that's with all the resources, allegedly, of the United States brought to bear. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, unimaginable devastation. And again, remember, hotter oceans have more energy, and more energy in an ocean creates hurricanes <coughs> that become enormously powerful really fast, and you don't have time to adapt to it.
more good news. Here is a remarkably insightful quote from Pope Francis after he had visited uh, the Philippines after uh, Hurricane Hayun, one of the most destructive hurricanes ever in human recorded history. And of course that's the underlying story of global refugees generally and climate refugees specifically, is that the price will be borne disproportionately. The, the most vulnerable populations on earth will pay the greatest price. I mean, there's real consensus on this, make no mistake. Precipitation anomalies, and again, remember that warmer air carries more water. And when it does finally disperse the water in a precipitation event, you get enormous volumes. There's some, so basically, this is sort of grade eight science, you probably all remember this stuff, that the water cycle works that evaporation off the oceans, precipitates into the waterways, returns <coughs> back to the sea, and that's been the normal homeostasis of water on Earth that we've understood. But it's not homeostatic anymore, it's out of balance. More evaporation from the ocean also means more evaporation from the land. And we'll see this in a moment. We already talked about warmer air holding more vapor. Sorry, that slides out of place. But how much more vapor? It's, not, it's a nonlinear relationship. One degree centigrade in temperature increase, 7% increase of vapor for every, for every degree. And what this results in is cataclysmic kinds of rainfall. So the downpours get bigger. And here's what they look like. Ooh. Now this, admittedly, is not, is, 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 this is actually a picture from uh, Montana. Uh, it, it does, these happen all, uh, all over the world. It's just a stunning photograph. It really doesn't look like rain at all, right? What does it look like? Yeah, it looks like an atomic bomb, right? And the kind of power and intensity there, there's, that's no mistake. They used to call these, and people still do call these, uh, microbursts, but this new volume and intensity is uh, the new term a lot of people are using is rain bombs for sort of, <laughs> sort of obvious reasons. Here's a rain bomb hitting Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, this is supposed to be animated. I'm not quite sure uh, what you can see if the, the video was working properly is water bouncing right off of the, off of the city. So what happens when you have rain bombs in, in fragile land, you have mudslides and more devastation and more dislocation. It's one thing to hit Phoenix, Arizona. It's another thing to hit other parts of the world like this. So you might recall, for instance, that what this results in is, is flooding. And you might recall, for instance, that last May, uh, southern Missouri and northern Arkansas were flooded. And parts of Fenton were impassable. Some of the lower uh, 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 highways were, were, un were impassable as well. Well, this is what was going on in South America. monsoons, this is unsustainable. Hundreds of people uh, 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 dislocated, temporarily maybe or permanently. And certainly deaths, destruction of homes all over Southeast Asia and Asia proper. And notice that a lot of these places are in the great grain growing, the great rice growing floodplains. And that is going to lead to second order effects. So it's not surprising if we look at this, uh, this graph that when we see storms go up, we see floods go up. The relationships are pretty clear. But we also see droughts go up because it's the same phenomenon. If water's coming off of the ocean, it's also coming off of the, of the earth that cannot support that loss. And increasingly, droughts are going on longer and longer, and water reserves are, are drying up. <coughs> this is a reservoir. Yeah. 
I mean, all over the earth, all over the world right now, reservoirs are drying up, including, you know, all over the Midwest. I mean, it's something we don't talk that much about, but the Midwest is a much drier place than it was even 10 years ago. Places that do not currently re uh, rely on, on, on irrigation uh, are going to have to, and that's a problem because aquifers are limited. But uh, this is about global issues, so I'll stop talking about the US. Uh, but it's happening everywhere, right? We're all in trouble. These are crops that are not going to come to harvest. Right? This is, this is a floodplain. <laughs> would not. Um, and as I'm sure a number of you in here know, right now the city of Cape Town in, in the Cape Province is basically right on the verge of being out of water. And if that's not an uninhabitable city, I don't know what is. So drought leads to famine, and starving people, if they can, relocate, if they possibly can. So it's not that we've never known famine in human history, but we've never known it on this scale, and, and, the, and the dislocations as well. So that's first order changes. What about second order, or sort of distal connections? So drought leading to extended crop failure, leading to famine, that's a pretty obvious connection, leading to internal dislocation. Typically, poor people are the ones stri stricken most hard by these kinds of losses. And typically, poor people don't have the resources to go beyond the borders of their country. Again, they're not going to qualify as refugees because of that. So they dislocate internally within their own, within their own um, countries. And big chunks of population moving around in cities leads to social destabilization. Our key story for this tonight is going to be Syria, as you'll see in a moment. And that leads to armed conflicts. And even if we don't like it, we get sucked into armed conflicts, even if we're not part of that original part of, of causal relationships. Notice here, by the way, that currently the three countries that are producing, that, that are single-handedly accounting for more than half of the world's refugees, are countries that have been experiencing drought and crop failure over extended periods of time, especially, of course, Syria and Somalia. Uh, and again, these numbers are official refugees. They don't count the 6.6 .6 million Syrians who were displaced from rural Syria to urban Syria. And here's the sort of set piece for why this matters to geopolitics. Well, the story starts actually in eastern Russia. This is a satellite photograph of, um, of Siberia in the summer of 2016. And what you see here is, is wildfires. These little sort of blurred dotted bits are wildfires all over eastern Russia. The same sort of thing, it's just a dramatic picture. The very same thing happened in 2010. Um, and the fires in eastern Europe were so <coughs> intense that, that in fact, in, in, as far away as Moscow, people were dying. I mean, several tens of thousands of people died of, of smoke-related inhalation-type events, 55,000. So again, from that same wildfire period in eastern Russia, the consequences of this was crop failure. Record highs of food prices. Because this is part of the, Russia and the Ukraine are part of the great, as long with the Midwest, are part of the great commodity grain growing uh, 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 areas of the world. And when they had food shortages, they stopped exporting. And the prices of global food commodities went way up. How up? This far up. And I hope that what you'll notice here is that we've got these two, oh, well, they're, what that said, <laughs> two spikes. Both of those spikes were preceded, immediately preceded by drought in in, in, the grain, in, in the grain belt area of, of, of Russia and Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern, um, Eastern Russia. And those food prices led to food protests and violence and destabilization. But this is the story that's really most dramatic. So some of you might recognize this story that what was going on in January 2011 in Tunisia was a particular moment that sparked a, a change, a geopolitical change that spread all across uh, 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 the Middle East that came to be known as the Arab Spring. And the inceptionary moment was not when a politician or an activist or any sort of agitator person did something, but a guy who was a food vendor, and some of you undoubtedly remember this, a guy who was a food vendor and had no food to sell, set fire to himself. And he didn't say death to the oppressor or anything like that. He just said, as, as, as he committed this very visible form of suicide, what can we do? What can I do? This absolute desperation, desperate people do desperate things. And it was that moment, that very public moment of resistance to injustice that spread the Arab Spring. Now, the results of that have been really quite mixed, I think we could probably accept at this point. But this is quite, whoa! Hang on, hang on. Oh! 
goes to cinema machine. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but this is climate change. Now it's not letting me advance. Uh, okay. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, great. Thank you. Magic. So again, remember those 6.6 .6 million Syrians displaced internally, largely, not exclusively, but largely rural people, farmers, whose farming land, once very fertile, had been reduced by long-term drought to, to desert, displaced to the cities. And that's where the rebellions and, and, and you know, where, where Syria is now uh, uh, has taken place, the armed conflict. And even if we don't care about Syrians, but none of us are jerks, but even if we don't care about our fellow human beings, we get sucked into these proxy conflicts. Right now, Turkey and Iran and Russia and the United States are all involved in Syria, and it's a climate change phenomenon, among other things. They recognize it. The Syrians know precisely what's going on here. It's the drought, and the drought is about climate change. And it's not just Syria, it's all across the Mediterranean. There's good news coming up, really, I swear. Just hold on to your socks. So what happens? People displace internally, and if they can, they displace beyond their borders because individually, you know, clearly Syria is not a safe place to be, and so people are leaving these places as well if they possibly can. And they don't always have welcoming uh, arms to greet them when they try to move to other places, like Europe, for instance. And as I'm sure all of you are aware that the response is the kind of, the kind of uh, uh, vast dislocations of people into uh, Western Europe is resulting in a tremendous amount of political destabilization in countries like Sp uh, France and, and Germany. And certainly, Brexit. This is a beautiful and attractive little, little ad that was used by the pro-Brexit campaign before the vote. And it's very clear that what they're doing is leveraging this kind of xenophobia to suggest to British voters that those other guys are going to let you get overwhelmed by the unwashed masses of the Middle East. And it was, it was successful, right? I mean, the Brexit vote carried on the basis of this kind of xenophobic nonsense. And the injustice of that is pretty horrible, but it's powerful stuff. And it's climate change. Disputes over refugees and resources and destruction by natural disasters and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think the point is pretty obvious. I think it's been made. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I think I might just zip a little bit. I think quickly, I think I may have squeezed this down already about water. But as I've said before, water, is water shortage, water resources are short all over the, all over the world, and that's a huge problem as well. Um, yeah, keep it. I mean, consider this. That's a reservoir. Consider the volume of water that is not there available for the people who depend upon it. This slide's out of place, I apologize. But anyway, the point being that, as I mentioned earlier, so we've got drought on the one hand and rising sea levels on the other, and we are largely a coastal species. And just consider the population displacement when Kankara, Mumbai, Dhaka are underwater, as will assuredly happen unless we do some other things. So what about responses? Now we're going to move on to what, what sorts of things are people advocating? Well, the United Nations Framework Convention uh, on Climate Change, and, it's, and the language here is virtually the same as the Kyoto Protocol from 1997, the Kyoto Protocol, which to my way of thinking, we quite embarrass, we, to our shame, we failed to, to ratify, America did, but many others did. The language is basically the same, that there are two twin strategies, adaptation and mitigation. So there need to be regional plans that mitigate climate change, and that simply means getting the stuff, stop, stopping producing the, uh, the greenhouse uh, creating uh, greenhouse gases, the, the climate change producing greenhouse gases. So mitigation, stop burning the fossil fuels. Adaptation, coming up with ways to make it easier for people to survive the changes that are going to happen already. So adaptation. There are lots of different ways, there's a kind of a spectrum of adaptation for climate change related dislocation from homes, all the way from what we might call forced or emergency moves, when a tsunami is threatening your house, you want to get out as soon as you possibly can, to planned relocations. So for instance, the island nations of uh, the Maldives or Kiribati or Vanuatu, these are really low-lying atoll nations, and they are all in various stages of buying land elsewhere to relocate their entire population. 
The Maldives are buying land largely in Sri Lanka and India. Kiribati is trying to buy land in the mountainous areas of Fiji. So Fiji is nearby, it's culturally quite similar, and they've actually got mountains, so they're not going to get swallowed up by rising sea level quite as quickly. Um, but that's not a solution, right? I mean, that's, that's people moving to a place where they're not going to be, uh, uh, where they're going to be strangers, and where they'll have voting rights. I mean, that will not come. The best adaptation in the world will not come without consequent human suffering. It's just a matter of how much suffering and how well it can be ameliorated. So many people have called for changing, and those of you who read the article I assigned uh, have, have pointed out that there's lots of agitation to change the definition of the 1951 Convention on Refugees so that the signatories of the convention will be obliged to step up to help. But currently, there's no particular legal reason why destination countries have to take people in. And a number of destination countries are really quite inclined to say, we'll help you, but you stay where you are. Just stay put, please. You one-third of Bangladeshis, you just stay put. So there's limitations to adaptation. So here, finally, we're embarking finally upon the good news part of tonight's talk, and that's the mitigation part. We've got to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that are currently in the atmosphere, and there are different ways to do it. Probably the most effective, though least sexy, if you want to think of it that way, is to simply plant a bunch of trees. And we're going to need to do that, for sure. But far more importantly than anything else is we have to stop emitting it. We have to stop extracting and burning fossil fuels and instead switch to renewable energy. And there's different sorts of renewable energies, for sure. Right. We have the solutions at hand. Now, here's the good stuff. Uh, as Al Gore says, we're going to lick this thing because we're already doing it. It's just a matter of how soon we do it. The sooner we do it, the reduction in human suffering. So in 2000, the projection, and this is just wind, by the way. <coughs> wind capacity was projected in 2000 uh, to reach 30 gigawatts by 2010. Turns out we were wrong. Way back. Way back. And I'm going to go through these really quickly, but the overall pattern is this, that the cost of the machinery, the cost of the installation is, goes down, the cost of the storage devices, the batteries goes way down, and the quality of the, of the technology goes up. So globally, as well as in the US, I just want to point one thing out. Um, these last two slides are not on the same scale. So it looks as though, it looks as though there's this logarithmic jump for global wind energy production. But notice this is 1980 through to 2016. It's kind of unfortunate. Whereas this one is just within the last 10, 10 or so years. So wind, produ wind installations in the US are also pretty, pretty, pretty dramatically jumping up. And it's because the cost went down, the, the market. Now, I know that market, relying on market forces alone has gotten us to some pretty evil places. But at least in this case, it makes financial sense to put in wind. It's free energy, and the cost of doing it has gone way down. And we're already doing it. And again, I apologize to, to a bit of time here. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. But all over the world, wind is supplying enough energy to do some pretty exciting things. Not just in Britain, not just in the United States, but also in parts of the developing world as well. So if all we did was wind, if all we did was go all out for wind, we'd have enough energy. And people used to say, yeah, but the wind doesn't blow all the time. But yeah, we have got battery storage now that we didn't have even 10 years ago. So if it doesn't blow today, it's going to blow tomorrow. But wind's not nearly as exciting as solar, so I'm just going to sort of leave at that. OK. The battery price has also gone down. That's the same story there. Sharp drop off. OK. Again, a lot of these, these guys, wild-eyed crazies, Bloomberg, really conservative. And they're like, yeah, this is how it's going to work. Solar's going to do it. General Motors, they're on. These are all these auto manufacturers who are either committed at some level to uh, uh, electrical cars or, 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 or currently or are going to later on. And the one that's really exciting that's not in here somewhere for some reason Volvo has made the commitment to take their entire fleet to electric. Anybody know? When? 2019. Their whole fleet. Any new Volvos from 20, unless, and unless, of course, they lie, which won't happen. <laughs> That's their commitment at this point, right? So wind, a good story. Solar, an even better story. Again, projections, one gigawatt per year seems pretty good. Turns out a whole lot better. And even better still because of that sharp uptick. That's where we're at right now. 
Throughout the world, solar uh, photovoltaic installations of solar energy is going up like crazy, and in the United States as well, and the cost of the cells is going down. It's that same pattern. Cost goes down, numbers of installations go up. We're doing it already, and so I'm going to just jump and forget about the numbers. And So these are some wind and solar things that we're doing here. Um, what this means is that if we stop subsidizing fossil fuels, People often say, oh yeah, but renewables, it's too expensive to go into. If we weren't subsidizing fossil fuels, they'd be at grid parity. Again, Deutsche Bank, not crazies. They, they, they are going to go where the money is, right? Morgan Stanley, same story. If we, get, if we stop artificially shoring up big oil, big coal, we're already there. And why? What, well, one of the things is we don't need big grid systems. A solar power on a house it, throughout the developing world. This is how the developing world is going to power itself up. Not by adopting our dirty coal technology. Right? Individual kids, an individual kid with a laptop and a solar panel. Beautiful. Up until the Paris Accord in 2015, both China and India were, along with the United States, the three big producers of greenhouse gases. And they still are, but what they've done in the meantime is they're going all out for renewables. They're taking their, coal, their new coal plants offline. They're making commitments to electrical vehicles, both India and China, and they're putting enormous amounts of solar and wind arrays. I'm just going to go very quickly uh, through all of this. Here's my favorite slide of all. Ah, oh, it's doing weird things. What, you're not off of the line. <laughs> this is the most beautiful slide in the world. Well, I don't know why that's doing that. It's an animation. Basically what it is, it's like 2011, 2013, 2014, 2015. And what it shows you is that tiny increases and then a crazy increase up to 15 gigawatts. Oh, that's really a shame. Come to my office sometime and see us. It's just <laughs> Point being, one country with forward-thinking politicians said, we're going for it, and they're going for it, and they're doing it. <coughs> they're going to be... 100% renewable in, in a reasonable amount of time. Right? <coughs> so why would you do that? Because it's free energy. Not just because it's for the good of the world. We can solve these problems and, and we don't have to take a hit in our standard of living either. Uh, and what that means here is, is jobs. Like the number one growing sector for new jobs is going to be solar and wind installers. Coal plants are going offline. New coal plant pro uh, proposed coal plants are being turned down, despite what's been going on in the White House. <laughs> and there's more exciting stuff. Old plants are being cut. <coughs> <Cool. Yeah. laughs> <laughs> forgot there was an audio on that. <laughs> All right. So now I'm going to skip past really quickly because we did run out of some time at the beginning for, for fun and games with, with stuff. But here's the point, right, is that China was one of the big three producers of greenhouse gases. The dirtiest gases have all come from coal, and they're dropping them. They made the commitment, they had the political will, and they've not come without some prices, admittedly, and some of you may know about that, we might talk about that later on, but they're going for it. Uh, yes. <coughs> it's flattened out. Right? There's that neat little flattened part of the graph that I pointed out earlier. First time in 40 years. We're already seeing changes happening. The sooner we get there, the reduction in suffering. And I want to come back to this question of suffering. So here's Paris, the Paris Accord in 2015. 193 countries in the entire <coughs> European Union. You would imagine they could agree on, on how, to, how to drink their coffee. And, and yet they agreed on the Paris Accord. They agreed to come to carbon neutrality uh, by 2030, I think. I think that's right. Right. So here's the point. Even if people in some parts of our country at some levels of government are saying no, it kind of doesn't matter. Here's why it doesn't matter. Because individual communities are doing it. Individual companies are doing it, going to carbon neutral. And it's because it makes good sense. It's not because people are saints. It's because the prices of batteries and solar panels keep going down. And if we stop pumping money artificially into fossil fuel and dirty technology, it's to our advantage, even if we're jerks and don't care about other people. <laughs> Goldman Sachs, right? OK. There's one last bit of fun. These are cities who have said they're going to go 100% renewable, and here are the cities that have already done it. Now, admittedly, Greensburg, Kansas had a leg up because they got wiped out by a Category 4 twister. 
And they said, well, if we're going to build up again, let's do it right. But that didn't happen with Rockport, Missouri. It's a tiny town. It's like, I don't know, 1,200 people or something. Columbia, Maryland has got some, is, is I think 200,000 people, maybe a little bit more than that even. So big places and small places are doing this. Why not Kirksville? Right? Why not Kirksville? It pays itself out and not, and not in a long period of time. So why does it not matter if the White House says no? Because individual states are saying yes. Individual cities are saying yes. Individual companies are saying yes. Communities are saying yes. And more of this, individual universities are doing this as well. Why not Truman State? Why not? Right? Thank you. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and how do we get there? We get there because of citizen activism. We get there because people say, we're not going to put up with this. We're not going to be part of this anymore. We're not going to fuel this suffering. Ours or other people's as well. So here's the climate change, climate march last spring. There will be another one this spring. If you can't make it to D.C., there's going to be one in St. Louis and probably one in Columbia as well. So i got to tell you, going to these things feels really good because then you say to yourself, it's not hopeless. We all feel good about this. We want to make this happen. i got to say, it's, if you're feeling depressed about what the last year and a half has been like, do yourself a favor and go to one of these marches. So here's an earlier photograph called uh, 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 <laughs> something rising. Something, anyway, it's 1968, a little bit earlier than the blue marble. So what, in closing, I'm going to leave you with just a few final closing remarks. In 1980, the, uh, uh, Academy, the American Academy of Sciences was tasked, under some political pressure, admittedly, was tasked with uh, coming up with a study to explore climate change. In what has now come to be a fairly notorious report, the authors concluded that climate change was real and that, indeed, it would have effects on communities throughout the globe. But what they concluded was that adaptation, the kind of adaptive strategies that we've talked about, um, would, uh, would occur and would be sufficient. And that, and here's the point, and as they said, quote, um, mass migration has taken place many times in the history of, uh, in, in human, across human history, roughly that quote. And so therefore, you didn't need to do anything about it. In so doing, those authors in 1980 basically sidestepped the very real human cost of human suffering of mass dislocation on a scale never before known in human history. Today, nearly 40 years on, we no longer have the luxury to ignore the real cost in human pain and suffering and misery of climate change dislocations. Because it's on the news nearly every night, right? from the overloaded boatloads of people in the Mediterranean foundering, from the dead and the dying being fished out of the Adriatic, to the iconic image of the father holding his, dying, de his dead child's body on the Greek shore, to the woefully malnourished people in the overcrowded UN peacekeeping camps throughout Africa. There is a real human cost in climate refugees, being paid by climate refugees. And so while we in the developed world have been dancing our 150-year dance, our waltz, our, our, our waltz with fossil fuels, the people who have been most at risk for paying the price have been those people who have most, or have, who have least participated in the benefits of, of, that, of, of those technologies. Now make no mistake, climate change is going to touch all of our lives. It, it already is. But it disproportionately touches the most vulnerable populations on Earth. Now, I didn't come here tonight, and I want to reassure you of this, I didn't come here tonight simply to ask you to join with me in some kind of collective spasm of first, real, first world guilt and self-flagellation. <laughs> Unless you want. <laughs> <laughs> but to make one very clear and simple point, it does not have to be like this. We can mitigate climate change. And we don't have to plunge our lifestyle and our standard of living into the 14th century in order to do it. All it takes is political will to make the changes. Political will to demand, to contact our elected officials, our members of Congress, our senators, our city mayors, to contact the CEOs of companies that we do business with. The political will to contact our university presidents and to demand that we want carbon neutrality. Because 
Eventually, whether we do it for the tens or maybe even hundreds of millions of climate refugees in the future, if we don't do it, we should do it for them, but we should do it for ourselves and for our children and our children's children. Because at the end of the day, really, we are all just fellow earthlings. Fellow earthlings on this, where is it, breathtakingly beautiful, finite planet, this blue marble. We need to start acting as if we have only got one home. Because we have only got one home. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thanks, Dr. Harker. We have time for questions, and she agreed to take her, moderate her own questions, so if anybody has any questions, go ahead. To the back. Uh, what about methane hydrate release in the Arctic? I'm sorry, say methane hydrate? Methane hydrate release in the Arctic. There's frozen uh, deposits of methane on the ocean. Yeah, you're talking about the, the, the very real possibility that the loss of the permafrost and the loss of the polar ice caps is going to really sink our boat. It's bad news. I mean, it, there's, there's already, like, it's, even if we were to change you know, how we're living, yeah. I think there's a, like an argument that there's enough PR in the atmosphere, enough like, greenhouse gases to kind of start a positive feedback loop. This world well, we're, way. yeah. And, and, the, and the word that people often use for this kind of discussion is the question of tipping points. Have we reached tipping points already? And another one, I mean, so one is, and some of you may know this, that the idea that once the, per, once the uh, perennial ice on the, on the polar caps, but especially in the Arctic, well, predominantly in the Arctic, gets melted off, then frozen methane gets released, and, and then we have so much more carbon going into the, in, in addition to the fact that when the polar ice caps are no longer reflecting, uh, uh, solar radiation, then we absolutely get into a, po a, a positive feedback loop. A, a similar one would be when so much of the, of the chunks of, of Antarctica have, have calved off that they're no longer reproducing. What, at what point are we at a tipping point? Um, yeah, uh, I don't know what to say about that other than that you know, we've got lots of climate models and some of them look really dire and some of them look less dire. And there are different ways that risk gets evalu evaluated in these very sort of elaborate computerized modeling systems. Um, but I guess what I would say to you, what I'd rather answer your question with is, yeah, that's a real deal and that's a big thing and it might destroy us, we might be doing it anyway. But I would really prefer to answer that in a philosophical way, which is, if we do nothing, then we're doomed. If we do something, we might still be doomed. <laughs> but maybe not. And that's kind of the best I can say at this point. Other questions? Other questions? I have a statement. In Please. In 68, we said it was five minutes till 12. <laughs> and we would go a little forward, and then a new president, and we would go way back every time. OK. Every time. And we have noticed it more because we did not live here all the time. We noticed it. How many women are, or families or people are willing to hang their clothes on a clothesline so that they do not use electricity to you, dry you, their clothes? You raise a much broader question which doesn't get addressed in this particular talk at all, which is, yeah, I mean the message that I'm offering you here is we don't really have to change anything, we just have to swap out dirty energy for clean energy and we can keep wasting sh <laughs> all the time. I personally philosophically think that we need to consume less and I think probably a lot of you in this room probably feel that we should consume yes. less. But we can make, you know, there's this phrase some of you have heard I'm sure that don't sacrifice the good in pursuit of the perfect. And if talking about reducing consumption turns off people who are at the entry level then talking about this kind of approach is a good way to start. And then maybe they'll start hanging up their laundry. And there's a guy who got killed by his neighbor for hanging up his laundry in the South at some point in the last year. Some people do have views about laundry. But besides that, <laughs> just recycle the boxes already. <laughs> recycle your boxes. Other questions or comments? <laughs> yeah? Um, you keep talking about the rise of sea levels and water. Is there any countries that are starting to use hydropower? Hydropower in the sense of what? Um, use, uh, 
water turbines to create electricity? Yeah, yeah, wave energy. It's not really, it's nowhere near as far along as, as solar and wind, but both geothermal and, and wave, basically sort of underwater or just at surface level turbines that make use of waves to generate energy. Yeah, it's kind of exciting stuff. I'm kind of a, a kind of a nerd that way. I'm like, oh, that'd be great. <laughs> so yeah, there's cool ways to generate energy. We just need to put the money into it, and that will cost. This stuff's already ready to go. I mean, it's already loaded up and ready to go. But yeah, that'd be neat. Other questions? Yeah. So if France can get 80% of their energy from nuclear, why can't we? We could. We could. It's not a renewable. No. Nope. And it doesn't burn fossil fuels. Right. It's and it uses clean. technology. Yep. So why wasn't that part of this presentation? Because. <laughs> <laughs> things going on with, with, with nuclear, right? Um, fusion is actually theoretically possible, but nobody's doing anything with it, and that's clean. Fission produces, sorry, yeah, fission produces spent dirty tailings and, and the possibility of food machines and things like that. And so I would personally rather have an energy system that when it fails, just doesn't, doesn't you know, generate solar energy as opposed to but, but yeah, you're absolutely right. And many people do make the argument that, that in order for us to make the bridge the gap to the part of entire renewables, that, again, that the risk, the cost-benefit analysis, the risk of, of, of nuclear may well be worth, may, may, we, may well be what we need to stop destroying the atmosphere. And if that's the price, I'm all for it. Yeah? Also, I might be wrong about this, I'm pretty sure nuclear power plants take like 10 to 15 years ago, the licensing and builds up and like, you know, yeah. The amount of, that we would need to fix the problem and the time it would take to build them, it's disproportionate. I appreciate that because clearly putting a, a PV set of, a, a PV array on your house is a matter of just really a few days or on your grass hut or what have you. So, so there's scale issues. And again, that actually is a good point is when we think about nuclear energy, we think about large power plants with enormous amounts of capital in, in, you know, put into making them work. And that only makes sense in a big decentral, a big centralized grid, energy grid, such as our coal power plants today function on. What I haven't said a word about, because it wasn't part of what I inherited from the Climate Reality Project, but some of you may know about microgrid technology. And microgrid technology is basically about, as it, it's in like really small grids. <laughs> so instead of having three major power plants somewhere south of, in the south part of our state, generating the vast majority of our electricity, Kirksville could be a microgrid. All we would really need is a couple of uh, a wind farm and a solar farm and, and, and a, a power station. And microgrids are more, they're, they're less susceptible to sabotage. They're much more nimble in responding to, uh, to changes in threats or to increased demand. And the really cool thing about it is, most people don't know this, but the big grid that we've relied on for energy since the beginning of grids is horribly inefficient. There's something like a 60% energy loss from the coal fired plant to your toaster. Yeah, that's outrageous, right? And we're burning coal for that level of return. So yeah, another reason to not put big new plants of any sort online is like, forget about the big plants and the big grids. Let's stop doing that. Champaign-Urbana, the University of Champaign-Urbana is actually a microgrid right now. And they have a bunch of different sources. There's a wind farm and a solar farm, and I think something else I can't recall what. Amaran UE, by the way, here's a fun fact. Our own Amaran UE, the, the regional utility here, was instrumental in turning Champaign-Urbana's campus into a microgrid. So they can totally do it. They're not doing it here, but they could. So, yeah. Soapbox, yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess the first thing that, that occurs to me is that renewable energy is really cheap to, to institute. I mean, that beautiful image of the grass hut with the, you know, people getting, they don't have to burn coal in their huts and have black carbon in their lungs and die horrible deaths. They can have clean energy and, and their kids can be learning. So that's my short answer. <laughs> Did you have something else in mind? Of the of 
Well, of course, that's one of the arguments that was made and does continue to get made when people are asking the countries in the developed world to lay off the, the traditional fossil fuel technologies. They, and they, they quite rightly say, like, easy for you to close the door. You've enjoyed it. But we don't have that standard of living, and, and we would like some of it. And, and that, I think, is an irrefutable argument. Other than what I would say to them is, totally, I agree. But this technology that you want to do, this fossil fuel technology, is also horribly polluting, and it will kill your citizenry. So yeah, you're right. You have the same right to pollute the crap out of the uh, atmosphere that we have. But you'd be better off and healthier if you didn't. <coughs> So helping them to get up to the standard of living with the use of clean stuff, I think that would be an ethical way to approach the answer. Yes, sir. Um, what can we do like, to really get public discourse, like seriously talking about climate change when we have a president that only denies it, while you know the Iran West and the West Coast burn from the most significant drought in you know, recorded history, and while he, Trump, at the same time, Guts the EPA publicly There's a open contradiction yeah. in the validity of uh, climate change while around us there are what I would consider obvious signs. So, what, what, at what point do you think you know, public discourse is really going like, to open up? Like, where, where is like, like, really, like, we talked about tipping point earlier. In your opinion, where is that tipping point for Americans? Let me say, first of all, that I'm impressed at the even nature of, of your language when you talk about these things that make my head personally explode. <laughs> it's very hard for me to talk about these things, and I was like, what? So, uh, but, sure. Uh, and of course, that some of you in the audience are in with me right now, which is English 227, which is communicating controversy. How do we talk about climate change? That's basically the whole course. And it's being offered in the fall, if you'd like to take the <laughs> It's a problem, right? But, but the majority of Americans <coughs> do not deny climate, anthropogenic climate change. But what we hear disproportionately is the voices that do. For some of my students who are in here right now made this point just this morning, which is that it looks like there's more denial because, well, for a couple of reasons. One, because it gets more play on talk radio and Fox News and it seems bigger than it is, but also because, as you point out, the, uh, uh, the, the POTUS has, has, has has marshaled strategically. I don't think he's committed to it personally. I don't think he's committed to much personally. But, um, but because it's been strategic for him to marshal the forces of that particular group of, of, of the demographic. So when you ask me, I guess one of the things I first of all say is, who cares? Who cares what he says, right? States are doing it anyway. Cities are already doing it. So join the resistance, I say to you, young man. Join the resistance. <laughs> Do what we're doing here right now. We march, we write letters, we get obnoxious, and, and we ruin Thanksgiving dinner when we go home. <laughs> <laughs> One more question, perhaps. No? Yes? Um, so obviously, like, mitigating these is a process. But in the meantime, there are people who are still being displaced. Yep. There's still desert still droughts like what do we do for those people like how do we, what resources are needed in those countries while we're mitigating but there's also still a humanitarian crisis there. no no there's so many different ways to tackle the problem and so on the one hand and, and again this is not my, my area of specialty and i'm sure geo, geopolitical people can say a lot more about this but i mean some people really fundamentally believe that the definition has to be changed so that then we can marshal the the, 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 the effect, uh, the change the, defini uh, the official definition, the 1951 definition, so that the signatories will be compelled. But the thing is, when you change the definition, do you need to have people re-sign up for it? But at least then, if you had a UN agreement that was you know, moderately binding in some way, then, then countries would be able to say, or, or refugees, who are then official refugees, would be able to say, our coastline just got inundated, it's not coming back, and you, Britain, Please find us a valley if you don't mind, because you've signed on to it. Um, there's a story, some of you read about this in the Okiolo reading, the, the, one of the three essays that was for tonight's talk. Um, a fairly notorious moment in the, in the Copenhagen summit where the, uh, the delegate from, from Bangladesh basically said to, I think he was specifically talking to the delegate from the UK and said, you know, 20 million people from Bangladesh are needing to be relocated. If we're talking about climate change, because it was the Copenhagen summit, he said, open your doors already, and the guy from Britain basically sort of said, mm, not so fast, I'm going to send you some nice stuff. 
So, so there needs to be you know, countries for obvious reasons, right? There's enormous amounts of stress when people come to you know to, to open your arms, even you know opening your arms to people within your own country. Florida right now with Puerto Rican, uh, uh, the, the Puerto Rican dislocated. There's stressors there, and what happens if it's not even your own countrymen? So you can't really blame countries for saying, you know, this is going to be a drain on us. We don't want to do it. But but yeah, if people don't have homes because they're underwater, I think. We let them in and we make sure that our elected officials, and we do what we can to make sure that when they get here, that they have a life way that's possible. That's not, that was just all vague and floofy, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs>